Hey everybody, today we're doing a video to talk about the Shelley hybrid phase and the deparameter and all that other good stuff. Welcome to the Shelley era. I hope you guys are enjoying it as much as I'm enjoying it. We're still kind of working our way through stuff. So huzzah and hallelujah. All right, so we are in the Shelley hybrid phase. I made the prior whiteboard video about this. Um, I believe maybe Mayish, Juneish, but uh, we're here now. And this began July 29th with the hard fork. Okay, and we have this concept of D, the D parameter. And right now it's set to one, and it's kind of like a wall that gets slowly but surely taken down. So the network is fully decentralized when D equals zero. So what D represents is basically uh, the set of blocks, the proportion of blocks made by stake pool operators, not the OBFT protocol. So right now, the network is operating in a static and federated mode. So the same set of OBFT pools are making blocks for no profit, no, no money. They just make blocks. And this is the way that we ran during the Byron era. So now that the Shelly hard fork is done, all the logic is in place to turn on Orbor's Prils, which is what Shelly is running under. And that's accomplished by setting D something less than one. And that tells you the percentage of blocks that are made by stake pool operators, the proportion of them. So there are really three phases to this. Okay. Okay, so, and they're determined by, hang on a second, let me uh, clean that up. There are three phases and they're determined by the D value. Okay, so the phase between D is 1 and 0.5. The majority of the blocks are made by OBFT with a minority made by Prios. Between 0.5 and 0, the majority are Prios and the minority are OBFT. And when we hit D equals 0, these OBFT nodes, I turn them off. They never run again. Huzzah. Pretty amazing. Okay. So this time period here is really a major validation that the network is healthy. The stake pool operators are actually making blocks and uh, we'll see an increase in participation. So you're going to see more SPOs. The rate of SPOs is going to increase. The amount of stake being staked is going to kind of hit some sort of threshold. So active stake will start going up and probably get asymptotic to some level, maybe 45%, 50%. So you have a big kick in the beginning, and then as exchanges get liquidity, more people come. Hopefully we get more than 50%, but most networks sit between 25% and 60% as a baseline. You never get to 100 because there's cold storage, lost coins, people don't want to participate, regulatory reasons in certain countries, and you know other things. There's friction in that. So you have more stake pool operators, you have more of this, and there are other metrics to follow. And you can kind of aggregate these into a concept of network health. Okay. All right, so this is kind of a shaky time where everybody's learning what to do and moving in and We'll have an easier time than most because we had the ITN and the Pioneer test nets with Haskell. So we should be able to get through this phase in short order. The bookend of it is that there's another hard fork plan. And by the way, we don't call them hard forks anymore. Let me hide that. We actually call them HFC events. Ha ha. Because we have the hard fork combinator and we can run both sets of ledger rules. So it's something unique to Cardano. We don't have to do hard forks anymore. So we have an HFC event planned right around here. 
And that's going to start implementing the Gogan style features. So native assets and Plutus foundations and other things. And during this time frame, we have another thread that's running. And that thread is all about peer-to-peer. So Marchin and his team is starting to turn on the peer-to-peer governor that was pre-installed in Shelley, and they're doing performance profiling and uh, policy to load up that, to turn on all the peer-to-peer capabilities. So as we're moving from D equals one to D.05, kind of during the majority OBFT phase, uh, we're turning on peer-to-peer and getting ready for that HFC event to turn on some Gogan related features. Then post that, as we're moving into the majority Preos phase, there's still a minority on the OBFT, and so there's some disaster recovery there, and the majority of the network is now being run by the state pool operators. And the bookend here is a little bit around D equals zero, uh, and a little bit beyond because it'll take some time to prime this. We're going to replace the update system with a fully decentralized update system, de-update. There's that dyslexia coming in, (laughs) de-update system, and Voltaire. So the bookend at the end of this phase is basically having a Voltaire HFC. So we take all the lessons that we learned from Voltaire running as a prototype and the DC funds and the improvement of voting and uh, higher participation there. And basically we roll them all up and then put them into a hard fork to fully integrate the decentralized update system and the treasury system into Cardano. And this is really the bookend of uh, the Cardano 2020 project. Basically everything we did from 2015 to 2020. At that point, the system is fully decentralized. 100% of the blocks are made by Preos. The update system is fully in the hands of the community. And Cardano has smart contracts and native assets, and it's it's running along, and it's a beautiful, beautiful thing. Okay? Now, there's an open question of how long should this take? Okay. So to get through all of this, you could you have to put some sort of drumbeat that gets you there. And we'll call this uh, alpha. And uh, it's a uh, constant decay parameter. And what we're going to do is we're going to have a blog post on Friday, the 14th of this month, that's going to set an alpha value, alpha equals something. And basically what that means is every epoch D is decremented a minimum of that amount. Okay, so by knowing alpha, you'll know the maximum amount of time it's going to take to get to D equals zero. Now we also have this concept of network health and you can kind of look at it as uh, something like green, you know, something like amber and something like red. So if you have some really nasty conditions going on, you can stop the constant decay. If you're in the green, the constant decay just continues and maybe you slow it down a little bit in amber. So we'll try to come up with a nice parameter for everybody to see here as an aggregate of the amount of active stake and the amount of stake pool operators and if they're making more than 90% of their blocks and so forth. But right now it looks like everything is gonna be green. People are very excited and there's a lot of competency in the core group. So we're gonna set a constant delay a decay parameter Friday the 14th and that will give us a good time horizon for when D equals zero. So a straw man parameter would be something like 0.0025. And if we did that, that'd be about 200 days it would take to get to D equals zero, perhaps faster. But this is the minimum constant delay, meaning that it every epoch will de- decrement at least by that much. The better the network conditions, the more confidence everybody has that things are working in the right direction, there's an acceleration of that decay. If network conditions are for some reason really nasty and things aren't looking good, especially in this phase 
uh, maybe we pause the decay for a bit, but we would like to have a constant decay parameter. So every five days you see that uh, occur. So we're gonna write a nice roll up of a blog post that talks about all this and has pretty pictures and uh, kind of explains what network health is all about and it explains uh, how we're bookending these two HFC events uh, and uh, so forth. Uh, that will give uh, a little bit more clarity, but I hope this helps a lot about explaining the phases and the hybrid phase. You have the majority OBFT phase that we're just about to enter. We have the majority Prails phase, and then beyond full decentralization. At this point, 100% of everything is run by the SPOs in the community, including even the update system for Cardano. We need the update system to ensure that we can deliver the hard fork combinator events in order. And once those are delivered, the system is self-sustaining completely. Okay, so that's the hybrid phase. Now, we had a lot of discussions this week about the D parameter and whether we should lower the D parameter next epoch or not. Yesterday, we released a communication that said, uh, business as usual, we're going to lower it. Um, after some more conversations today, specifically about the exchanges, uh, we've had some anomalies and issues with certain exchanges. In particular, there's some emergent bugs that have come from how they're using our software in virtual environments that have made it really difficult for us to replicate those bugs on our side, but they're apparent on their systems. So what the backend team did and the benchmarking team did is we created a custom version of Cardano for those exchange operators uh, to get additional logs so that we can figure out what's going on in their environments that prevent them from migrating. Um, uh, this is about three or four exchanges of the 15. Now, uh, other exchanges like Binance and uh, recently today, Bitfinex, um, obviously don't have these issues and have liquidity again, but other exchanges um, do. And some of those exchanges do have a lot of ADA bound at them. So given that we had the presentation bug where one third of the stake pools uh, were not being properly displayed, given that a large amount of ADA is sitting on exchanges still and people want to get it out, but there's going to be a few more days um, added to that transition uh, for people. And given that we've had a few other bugs along the way that have reduced um, competitiveness for stake pool operators, uh, we are now in a situation where I think it's prudent that we delay the uh, decrementing of D to uh, one more epoch. So instead of having it occur next week, it'll be the following epic, just so that we have a more egalitarian participation. I understand that this is a bit unpopular and that some people may be upset about this. Other people will be very happy about it. It's a controversial decision, but ultimately I have to make decisions like this uh, for the good of the ecosystem. And we have always, when faced with hard decisions, erred on the side of the community and erred on the side of fairness. And it's just not fair if one third of the stake pools were not properly visualized. It's not fair when a big chunk of ADA is still sitting in exchanges and people are waiting for liquidity to participate to start the system uh, without them. We don't want to leave some people behind. So uh, we've already made considerable improvements. We resolved the Daedalus bug. Uh, we re have made a lot of uh, improvements in certain things so that most of the exchanges are now on the path for full liquidity. And we've increased um, some of the software logging and monitoring for those who are still having some difficulty transitioning. It's a very difficult thing to get all your exchanges online, principally because there's more than 15 of them and they all have different infrastructure, languages, standards, different environments. Some are very transparent, others are not. In some cases, some exchanges, they just ask random questions and we ask, well, what's the context? We'd love to help you. And they don't reply back. Other exchanges have been incredibly open and communicative with us. And uh, they have been willing to share exhaustive log details and infrastructure information, which gave us the ability to help them directly. So there's a spectrum of collaboration and cooperation there. And um, where and when we can, we do. And unfortunately, because some of these setups are very exotic, they tend to introduce exotic bugs or exotic things that we can't replicate ourselves without more context. So we can't fix them because we can't replicate them. Uh, so that's just the teething pains when you go through a major transition like this. And we redesign the software so that after they get integrated, 
we don't have to go through these types of teething pains again. That was the point of the Adrestia project. But we are where we're at, and the reality is we have to give it a little bit more time to see all those guys go green. No one's, uh, no one's going to take a break or go sleep until that gets done. So we'll make sure that that gets done. There's also the issue of Uroi. A large amount of aid is still in that ecosystem, and uh, Sebastian and his team have been working overtime to get full Uroi support. So Uroi's back online for Byron, and Shelly support is coming, and hardware wallet support is also coming on their side. We finally got the Ledger and Trezor into the fold, and firmware updates have been issued. The users of Aid of Light are able to uh, to use their Ledger and Trezor there. Uh, and uh, looks like Uroi will be soon for that capability as well. So a little bit more time. We're not going to decrement D this window. Uh, we'll do it the next epoch, and then we're going to publish that blog post on February 14th, which will contain all the details. We'll set the constant decay parameter uh, so that you guys can see roughly when D is going to equal zero. Uh, we're going to be in the majority OBFT phase for a little while, but not a huge amount of time. And then it'll be bookend with an HFC event, which will uh, go ahead and uh, get um, Gogan out of the way, at least part of Gogan. And uh, then we'll do another HFC event at the end of the decrementing, uh, so around or a little bit past D equals zero, to pull in all the Voltaire capabilities. At that point, disaster recovery is no longer possible. So whenever you build a high assurance system and you build a system on completely new technology, you always build layers of fail safes into that system just in case. So uh, the D parameter technically can move in either direction. It can go down or it can go up. The only reason it would go up and it wouldn't go from 0.5, for example, to 0.51, it would go from 0.5 back to 1. The only reason it would go up is if there was a catastrophic flaw in the design or bug of Orboros. Orboros is a completely new protocol, and we weren't crazy enough to just throw it over the fence and say, good luck, everybody. We built uh, a backup system just in case, and that's why OBFT exists. So uh, we kind of march our way through it in a systematic way to get to D equals zero, but we do have a disaster recovery mechanism in place until D equals zero and the update system is decentralized. Now, once that's removed, uh, the system has to be sustainable. There is no failsafe. There is no backup system. It's, um, it's basically completely decentralized at that point. Uh, but this is how we build software. And this is how sensible, reasonable people build software who have a moral responsibility to make sure that the things that they do are right. Uh, so you do it systematically and you do it with an increasingly larger and larger set of people. If you look at this layout, we go from here, an operating model that could run indefinitely and we're all comfortable with, to increasingly more uncomfortable territory, where suddenly more and more of the network is made by Braos, to a point where none of the network is made by OBFT nodes. Now, along the way, we're going to discover all kinds of things, uh, performance issues, slight bugs here and there, configuration issues hardening of the software to prevent vectors of attack, perhaps improvements to the network protocol that need to be made for certain things that are reoccurring, optimizations here and there. And as we walk that journey together, it means that when we get to this point, we have no uncertainty. We feel very confident in the things that we've done. And we believe that the things we've done are going to stand the test of time. And that is process is what allowed us to even get to D equals one to begin with. Now, what's so cool about this is in the broader scope of things, this is actually not a lot of time. As I mentioned, 200 days, if we were at 0 0.025, as an example, uh, that means in the February to March time frame, we'd be looking at uh, 4D to equal zero. Now, I'm also going to point out that whether D is one or zero, this doesn't substantively impact the profits of staking. The same amount of money is paid whether D is 0.9 or D is zero. Okay, so it all it does is it means that we're losing our training wheels and we're handing them off and everyone's learning how to ride the bicycle. And at some point they just have to accept that sometimes they're going to fall off the bicycle and scrape their knees. But you know what? That's life. And that's what the point of these systems are. So it's, uh, 
it's kind of a humbling moment to be here in the Shelley hybrid phase. This is uh, proof in the pudding. Prouse is a protocol that we designed over a multi-year period. Uh, it is a very complicated protocol. There's a lot of moving pieces to it. And it's the culmination of the, of the foremost science in our industry. Uh, and it's the first proof of stake protocol of its nature in class, that it has been verified with rigorous mathematical proofs, and it's been verified with rigorous engineering standards. But all of that pales into comparison with where we're entering today, uh, the process that we're going through today. Uh, we are now going from the lab and going from simulations and test nets, and we believe it works, to handing it over to people we have no relationship with to take and use to build themselves. And uh, we believe firmly from the evidence we gathered from the ITN and from the pioneer test nets that that process is going to work. But on the other hand, the proof is in the pudding. You actually have to do it. You have to see it. Uh, it reminds me of when I watched the recent launch with SpaceX, where NASA and SpaceX had worked uh, hand in glove for year after year after year and many demonstrations and test scenarios to get to a point where NASA felt comfortable enough to put human beings into that rocket and blast them off to the International Space Station. Now, I watched that launch live and you could see how nervous everybody on the SpaceX team, the NASA team, and the astronauts themselves were about the launch. A completely new rocket that had never launched human beings to space before was now being for the first time ever tested in that way. And there's always a first time for these things. And as a testimony to that great company and their collaboration with NASA, another great organization, it was a successful launch end to end. And uh, everything worked out the way it should have been. Um, I remember watching footage of Columbia and Challenger where that wasn't the case. And there's always a non-zero chance of something blowing up, you know, something going wrong. Now, good engineering means that you plan for that, which is why we have the disaster recovery. It's why we have this de-decrementing. It's why we're moving in this direction so that we're not betting the entire farm on a single event and hoping to God that it all works. Uh, we have the ability to recover from a variety of disaster scenarios. But at the end of the day, at some point, you do have to get into the rocket. You do have to blast off. And you do have to have faith that the homework you did, the work that you did, is going to get you where you need to go. Every now and then, you have to delay a launch. Uh, every now and then, uh, you have to slow something down here and there or do an extra safety check. Uh, for example, this uh, decrement, we're holding off an epic. Okay. Sometimes the weather is not where it needs to be because something came up. But there will be a moment when you have to push the button. So we did that with the hard fork. And now from here on out, we know that the hard fork combinator works and it's been tested at scale and the network works perfectly. So we know we can do hard forks in ways that no one else in the industry can do. And that's something that's there in our uh, designs for the rest of time. And that's a beautiful thing. And as we move from D equals one to D is less than one, someone is going to be the first person outside of Amergo, IOHK, and the Cardano Foundation to make a Cardano block. That's going to be an exciting moment. And for the stake pool operator who does that, uh, I'm going to talk to the Crypto Supreme guys and see if we can get them uh, some uh, custom merchandise and congratulations. And uh, I'll personally sign some things and send it to them. So good luck to you. I, uh, I'd love to see the stake pool that makes that block. And they reach out to us. We'll be happy to send them something because it is a historical moment. But 20 seconds later, another person is going to make a block and so forth. And you know what will happen is by the time we get to D equals zero, it's routine. It's just business as usual, just like running a Bitcoin mining pool is business as usual. That's the life we live in. And if we've done our job right, stays green and no one really cares. It just is tomorrow. So uh, it's a humbling to be here and uh, I'm glad that we are here and it's going to be truly incredible to see all these things come together. You know, we have two more HFC events minimum peer to peer on its way and a ton of experiments with Voltaire. Another humbling moment that's coming is the DC fund. The first fund to actually dole out money is coming in sooner than you guys think. Um, and uh, that's going to be fun to see people get funding from the system. 
and every iteration we'll get more accessibility and more tooling for it. But another humbling moment will be when we integrate all of the Voltaire capabilities from a sandbox into a permanent feature of the Cardano blockchain. And at that point, we can't modify it anymore without a full vote of the system as a whole. So again, training wheels. Welcome to the Shell era, the hybrid phase. Hope you guys are enjoying it as much as I am. Um, I wouldn't worry too much about the exchanges and I wouldn't worry too much about the other infrastructure. You know, you always run into this. Uh, anytime you're dealing with a very complicated distributed system that's been used for many years in a particular way, and you go to a completely different way, it's exceedingly difficult to have a very smooth transition for everybody. Some people were able to get there because of the way their systems were built. Other people have not quite gotten there yet. It is what it is. Normally exchanges need four to eight weeks to prepare for a hard fork. Uh, these exchanges are doing what they would do in four to eight weeks in less than two weeks, which is an extraordinary thing. So we commend them for the work that they're putting in. Uh, some have been not as communicative as they really need to be and not as helpful as they need to be. But for the most of them have been exceedingly good to work with and willing to work with us hand in glove to get things done. And uh, we're writing a lot of custom things to help them along the way to make sure that that transition occurs well. Um, no aid has been lost. It's just inaccessible for certain cases. But that's what happens when you go through these upgrades and um, we'll all get through it. So uh, the weather's not so good for the next epoch, but the one after it is. Uh, everything is moving in the right direction. Binance uh, came online yesterday. Bitfinex came online today. Congratulations, Bitfinex, for entering the Cardano ecosystem. Uh, that's uh, one we've been waiting for for a few years. We're glad to have you here. And the rest of these guys will go green momentarily. And uh, next week will be a good week. Uh, we should see some improvements in Euroi next week. Uh, and we should see even more improvements on the node and wallet backend and Daedalus next week and more features coming. So uh, August is coming along exactly as we expected it to. So have a little patience, hang in there. And I look forward to the majority BFT era as we go from D equals one to less than that. And look for the blog post on the 15th. Thank you, everybody. And until next time, have a nice day. Cheers.